we have anything that he hops on or is like very seriously the quote unquote driver of, which is currently he's like driving Twitter, right? Um, I would be extremely wary about <laughs> where it's going. Uh, the more he pays attention to it, because his yeah, attention is just <laughs> it's like a cost. I think it's, it's like a dumb eye of Sauron. Scotch. <laughs> 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 Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 389 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast, Butterscotch Shenanigans. I'm Seth, and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam, and I'm the webs programmer. I'm Sam, but I'm holding back a sneeze. And this is a show where we talk about life, business, and working in the games industry. Today is November 11, 2020. You. Is it? Yeah. yeah. November, November 11. November one of the best 11. Days. No, it's November 11. 11. Speaking of sneezing, yesterday I was like just standing in the middle of the kitchen and I was like a sneeze was coming on, you know? No, no. And you know how when it's coming on, you start to like, you can like, you, like if you want it to, if you want it to happen, you like try to like, you like start, you get all dramatic about it. Like things are happening. Oh, yeah, right? of course. So, yeah. Uh, so I just wasn't really paying attention to anything else. And then my, my wife just like came walking in front of me, right? As like my head reared back and my eyes closed, you oh, know? No. <laughs> and so I just like sneeze in her general direction with like, enormous <laughs> violence, and, uh, which I just thought was really funny too. Because I was like, I mean, I mean, she it's wasn't like you looking waited at for me, it. you know? <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, but it seemed like I was just like there. Like, <laughs> like a sne- a sneeze trap. Yeah, it's dangerous. Mm. At the gym Imagine the that day. just just rounding a corner and just instantly being sneezed yeah. on. It's what a good a, trap. What a, It'd keep you out of a place. Is. You know, yeah, if you heard the, there's wild is. sneeze turrets in an area, you'd be like, oh, I'm not going in there. Sneeze no. turrets. Did we already get the profanity okay. warning that it happened? No, but there's okay. profanity. All profanity right, carry warning. On. Cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's all I had to say. I just wanted to make sure before I said anything else that we snuck that in there. Mm. Yeah. Good thought. Uh, also, we'd like to thank our recurring supporters over at moneygrab.bscotch.net. Thanks for uh, letting us grab your money monthly. Yeah. Uh, monthly. All right. So we got we got a, a few interesting things to talk about and uh, probably a few uninteresting things. You know, we got to keep a good balance. Oh, yeah. We got we to gotta punctuate the excitement with plenty of boredom. Just really mix it up. Well, otherwise, get- otherwise, if you're on the hedonic treadmill, because the whole idea of the hedonic treadmill is you just get used to stuff that's good and then it's not good. Yeah, 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 yeah. We so- got to reestablish anchor points, really disappoint our listeners for quite some time. And then yep. when we do something interesting, boom, it's like it's so refreshing. It's like those variable rewards. Points. That's how video games work. Yeah, 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 you yeah, never yeah. know what's going to come out of the loot box. Same thing, podcast yeah. might be garbage today, but might be great. Who We're really? all just dancing pigeons. You know, that's, that's right. That's right. This this is just a podcast tip brought to you by game designers. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. got to keep that engagement high. Uh, well, so I'm back from my trip to India and it was great. Uh, cool. First time traveling there in three years, three years ago in 2019 around this time was the last time I went. And I came back and was sick for six weeks with a mysterious illness. Hmm. COVID. <laughs> Perhaps. Around December 2019. So, you know, uh, I'm not saying I I was patient zero, but was I? And this time uh, I came back okay, but now uh, I am starting to get uh, stuffed up and a sore throat. So I was thinking, you know, it's probably it would be a miracle if I did not get sick That's on this true. trip because – I have not been sick since then because I've been in my home masked up because of a global pandemic in the intervening few years. So, uh, but anyways, it was great. It was nice to get out of the house and get really, really far out of the house. I was going to say, you were, you were like, I got to get out of the house. How about just, I gotta, you just, just heated yourself opposite. across the planet. Yeah. yeah. Can I go to the opposite side of the planet? That's as you far away from my house. So <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, Air travel over these long distances gets gets. Oh, it's wild. I feel like it's worse in in multiple dimensions because I feel like you know air, airlines are always like cost cutting and trying to squeeze every last fucking millimeter of mm-hmm. elbow space and leg room and whatever, um, and upcharging you for everything. So like, air travel is just always getting worse. But so is my body. Like so, mm-hmm. so is my ability to handle bullshit. That's getting worse. Every year, so uh, this time around, it, it kind of messed me up. Like mm. both directions, I ended up just coming home and uh, essentially sleeping the whole weekend. I, I had a, one stretch where I just slept for thirteen straight hours. Just it's like the only way to do that that full 
clock reset when you're coming from the other side of the planet. I think it's it's easy to be like, well, it was like so just, oh, what a painful journey. But it's like you are on the other side of the fucking planet. Yeah, and, and honestly, like, <laughs> you did it. You did it too fast, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like it used to be like, oh yeah, if you want to go to India, it's like, all right, well, say goodbye to everyone you know and love because you might not make you're it not back. coming back. Yeah, you're <laughs> going to die on the way there, actually. Yeah, you're going to die on the way there. If you do make it, it's going to be eight months later. And you're going to have scurvy. You, you're going to have scurvy and, 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 and a new child um, <laughs> yes. will have been conceived and born during the trip. All of that. Uh, so this time around, it's like, okay, I leave at three o'clock in the, in the morning. I travel for 24 hours and I land at 3 p.m. the same day (laughs) (laughs) because you're going so fast that you can travel across 12 time zones in 24 hours. And so it's so you have a 36 hour long day, which Mm -hmm. and then the, the real kicker of it all was that started getting getting acclimated back to the the new time landed on Friday. By the end of Saturday, I'm like, okay, I'm starting to, starting to feel like I'm getting back on track. Boom, daylight savings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. So, uh, so, the, so you're like, oh, I feel like I'm waking up at a good time. No, now I'm still, I'm off by an hour. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, so anyways, I, you know, I'm, I'm mostly, mostly back on track. It's good to get back into the office and start getting some work done again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and while I was in India for so these past couple of weeks, some stuff happened. Mm-hmm. Especially some stuff in the Twitter verse. Oh boy, and and the metaverse. So we'll talk about the verses. And these have been uh, fast moving stories, you know, because because Elon took over, I think last week, last week, right? Like, like a, a week. week and a half ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like beginning of last week, and uh, like we all knew that he's an idiot and doesn't know what he's doing, and it was going to be chaos. Yeah, but the sheer degree. Mm-hmm. Of dumb fuckery has been <laughs> it's been astounding. Just astounding. <laughs> the it's Swift been is- like um, it's been amazing. And, I, and, my, and you know, and I I feel horrible for the literal thirty five hundred people who instantly lost their jobs. Like that sucks. Sucks. Um, yeah. And just kind of goes to demonstrate like this is this is how billionaires are made. It's not by being good at stuff. It's by uh, crushing they everybody are, around them, you know? So. Yeah. They are capital extractors. Yeah. They they show up at a place. They, they, for starters, they already have a bunch of money. Then they take that money and they use it to squeeze more money out of other places where there is money. Yeah. Right. They're money miners. They don't, they don't, they don't do anything. The fact that he could be CEO of three companies at the same time. Yeah, I should tell you something. Yeah. And the one that he's actually touching the most right now is the one that's just like it's something that it's true. The one that's doing the worst is whichever one he's, he's currently running. spending time in. <laughs> but the remarkable thing is because this, this is something that I think is is actually important to anybody who's like trying to start a business and you know that stuff, right? There, there's the the reality of like once you kind of start to get success under capitalism, because it's a feedback loop, right? Is that there's a certain point of scale that you reach where it's actually really hard just to like completely collapse. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the amount of momentum that you have just from take like just from using the system as it exists makes it so that you can absorb so much mismanagement. And like, and this is why, because like you talk to anybody in in like most large corporate environments from companies that have been around for a long time, you know, Fortune 500, all that kind of stuff. Right. And you won't find a soul working in those companies who's like, yeah, this is run well. This is good. You know, yeah, right? Tremendously inefficient. And yet somehow. Yeah, exactly. It's so so that's important to keep in mind, yeah. too, as you're There's watching Elon of, burn this thing to the ground, is that this is hard. It's actually hard yeah. to destroy a company of that scale. Just period. It's hard to do, right? And to be able to do it this fast is just well um i mean it is like it's amazing it's amazing it's what's impressive. It's i'm very impressed impressive. yeah i'm not even mad <laughs> and honestly like i've always hated twitter i've been somewhat vocal about that i feel like it's just a stupid place um but yeah. anyway, but there are but there are real communities there you know there are people who have made their living um via their twitter communities who are now trying to figure out what are they going to do now you know um and so yeah. it's it just just like i mean cuz it's, it's like the real the real tragedy here is that 
Yeah, like Twitter's also a place of horrible fuckery that's destroy, helping to destroy democracy. And all it's essentially stuff, right? what allowed uh, huge amounts of COVID misinformation and yeah. Donald Trump to become president yeah, and like, yeah, all kinds it's, of other it's overall, fun things. It is a force for ill, probably, on, you know, net, right? But there are individual stories within it and like small groups of stories mm -hmm. within it. Cause like, you know, there, there've been, you know, uh, human rights campaigns like that have like managed oh, yeah. to survive because of Twitter and all this kind of stuff. So there's like real good in there and all that's also being just destroyed without any meaningful replacement. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's like, there's, it, it is like on the one hand, it is hilarious to watch Elon just absolutely suck at doing something. Right. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and just like how amazing it is to see somebody that incompetently destroy something, right? But it is also yeah. true that like this is horrible. What's well, happening? I think it's important to notice that social media platforms in general, whether it's YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, the reality is that you as a person participating there are the are the person creating value for the company. But in return, you're supposed to be able to over time basically build up a stable base of value that you can then you know actually essentially make a living off of, right? And so the challenge is that it's a platform that owns your stuff that basically cannot care about you on an individual level in the same way that, you know, you would obviously care about yourself. And so you see this with, I mean, like every month there's like a new YouTube drama about the algorithm changing or, uh, you know, even you talk about Steam, it's the same kind of deal where like you, you're, you're participating on a platform means that you aren't in charge of the, just the baseline rules about how stuff works. So you can invest a ton of energy and time into like growing a following, which we've done. We did on Facebook at one point um, in our early days. And then Facebook changed how you actually got to talk to your followers such that it wasn't worth anything for us anymore to have done all of that work, right? And so- Yeah, because you had to, they, they, they were really early to this idea that, you know, Elon has with, with Twitter of like, yeah. oh, if you pay money, then people can see your stuff. Yes. Uh, exactly. And Facebook did that forever ago where, because yeah, I remember that all of a sudden we like, we logged in and like we were making, I think posts about our podcast or something. And- they had originally been going to like everybody who followed the page, which was, I can't remember, like 10,000 or 20,000 mm -hmm. people or something like that, um, which is really cool, you know? And we're like, oh, yeah, Jeez, we can like, use this to help grow, you know, the podcast, right? And then all of a sudden, like, we're getting like five views or like yeah, a hundred views. views. And yeah, you get yeah. like nothing. Just like nobody's seeing it. And then Facebook starts popping up these little things. It's like, hey, hey, buddy, you want, you want people to see this? You can pay us $5 and we'll show it to 100 people, you know? And, yep. and that was suddenly, there, and we were just like, oh, fuck this, right? And we basically left Facebook and never looked back That from that moment. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's what inspired us to build our all of our news, newsletter stuff, email newsletter stuff, because email is one of the few places where you yeah. have a more direct capability. But I think that the general point is that it gets, you know, hanging your hat on someone else's platform always has this risk with it. I think the zany part is the fact that usually you had this kind of like a conglomerate or like a, you know, there's like a board of directors or whatever else. There's like a sort of a diffuse entity who is causing the pain that you feel in regards to like, uh, you know, the YouTube algorithm. No one knows, like, it's not like Steve who, who like changes the YouTube algorithm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's like Elon Musk is just sort of just straight up, like just torpedoing, not just Twitter, but also people who depend on Twitter and who have been, built up yeah. a tremendous amount of value for themselves on Twitter. Um, and it's just sort of, and it's done and with such lack of regard that it's just kind of, it's, it's, well, it's horrific, but also amazing yeah, to watch. Um, yeah, the sheer amount of sociopathy involved with yeah with it is Well, I think it's also, amazing. it also shows, to me, the most interesting thing has been learning about, about how, how the world looks to somebody who just has so much money that they, they can't fail at anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like, no matter what he does, he will come out a bill, a, a multi-billionaire, yeah. Uh, because so you know he's he's the richest man in the world, um, in terms of net worth, right? But that net worth is wrapped up in all kinds of things like shares of Tesla it's, stock. Yeah, he's like, yeah, it's like the valuation that. of his companies, basically. Is yeah. Where, yeah. Right? yeah. And so so what he's been able to do, and, and his net worth has gone from two billion ten years ago to two hundred and twenty billion or something now, um, all because of these these companies that that he owns, right? And He's he's using this to kind of like extract cash out of – he's using this Twitter thing to extract cash out of his net worth and convert his shares of these companies and stuff into, into cash. So like he was able to go to banks and say, hey, I want $44 billion of a loan to buy Twitter, 
right? And the banks are like, mm, that seems kind of risky. And then he can point to his Tesla shares and be like, well, these I, I, can, I, I have all these as collateral, right? And then the banks are like, okay, fine. You know, you have all these valuable assets, which are literally just pieces of paper, right? Uh-huh. That oh, don't do anything. It's not like getting a mortgage where there's an actual house, you know? Well, so like you don't you get taxed on them. This is an interesting note too. I saw from uh, yeah, so, a while ago. This is how billionaires, show. they are able to just not. Yeah, pay. there's no property. There's no annual property tax on yeah. your shares of Tesla exactly. stocks. So the point is also like not you, on the loans that you take out. So they just get yeah. to have money. Yeah. yeah. So so you get this sort of like this, this tax-free asset uh, and even if he does sell his shares, they get taxed at 15% in the US, which is the lowest tax rate of anything, right? Because it's a capital gains tax. So so you get to basically keep all of it, but then he can – so he can take this giant loan. He can buy Twitter. And then and then when he buys Twitter and, and takes over, mysteriously, Twitter's uh, daily operating loss goes from like $1, billion or $1 million to $4 million a day. Why? Because – He's able to reassign the loan from himself to Twitter. Mm-hmm. So Twitter is now holding the loan and is responsible for paying it off. And now he fires half of Twitter staff and goes on an aggressive cost-cutting uh, campaign yeah. so t- so that Twitter can pay off the loan that Elon Musk took out, right? So it's it's this kind of shell game. I, of didn't, like, I didn't know that he actually – because that also means that then yes. if he – if he files for bankruptcy for Twitter, that they can't He's touch fine. his his assets outside right. of the loan. Correct. Yeah. Right. So this is this is called a leveraged buyout, where you can you can take out a loan, buy a company, reassign the loan to the company, and then make it so that the company that you bought becomes the collateral for the loan. So that if you if the company goes bankrupt, that company's assets get seized and not yours. Right. Mm-hmm. And so so you can just you can just D- just delete like an entire company and just squeeze a bunch of cash out of it <laughs> as with a giant yeah. with a giant salary for yourself and whatever else and just burn it to the ground right this is something that private equity firms do all the time right they they basically take a failing company and figure out how to make how to enrich themselves and liquidate it into into cash right in this case he's doing it not to a failing company. Well, I, I guess it's de- debatable because yeah, Twitter debatable. was always kind of operating at a loss, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it was kind of propped up by loans and invest investor money kind of this whole time. Um, so arguably Twitter was a failed business model. So he's coming in and saying like, it's a failed business model, but it's huge. So if I come in here with a leveraged buyout, I can just like just take, just mm-hmm. take all the money that's in this giant Twitter you know, war chest uh, and burn it to the ground and then, and then, you know, come out of that with like 10 billion, like basically, you know, come out of that with like 10 or $15 billion cash. Whereas before he had $44 billion of just assets that weren't actually usable. Yeah. I do want to say that uh, if anybody who's, is still a Elon fan after all this, after like, after just, it's it's easy to be a fan of someone like this when they are uh, only barely visible. Right in public, because really, like when he was just point, getting started with like Tesla and SpaceX, and easy. all you knew was like, "Oh, is that like the PayPal guy?" And oh, he's trying to like make a new like space exactly. program. That's cool, right? That's mm-hmm. all you knew. Yeah. Um, very easy to like fall in love with that character because you're like, "Wow, so wealthy," and then clearly like all about this humanitarian efforts for like zany futuristic ideas. Yeah, until you, you look kinda, at any of them. Well, until you look at it. But that's the thing. Is like, I think over the last while now, we've gotten just like too many, too easy and too long a looks at this guy. Uh, and I will say that I read his, uh, I think this morning, someone posted a transcript from the all hands meeting that was called today for Twitter employees, where he basically was saying that, you know, remote work is no longer a thing. And then went on to what I what, and I think this, the important I'm trying to get here is like if you're a fan of this guy you're going to see this as visionary leadership which was this insane ramble he went on about how Twitter is going to become a payment platform um, to sort of like become the people's financial institution uh, that it's you know also going to do video and video ads to compete with YouTube um, and then that people are going to start being able to earn uh, livings directly from Twitter in the same way that they do from content on something like YouTube. Um, as well as a bunch of other things that I'm forgetting because it was a long, insane ramble. Uh, a long I think the laundry list. Yeah, the challenge is that, like, depending on the regard with which you hold a person like this, you look at that particular kind of speech and view it either as 
visionary, which I think a lot of people still find Elon to be like, wow, he's got so many, oh yeah, Twitter is a payment platform. Yeah, sending a direct message is the same as sending money. Like it's all, uh, you'll see that crowd. But then on the other side, um, you see people, I think who maybe have had a little bit more experience with people like this or see what's going on, which is like, he's just using a particular way of talking about things that sounds visionary, but actually completely lacks direction. It's directionless, right? And you see this actually because in the, the moderators, you see like basic questions the employees are asking. And at some point people are like, so are you saying that we should do like, is X the focus or is like Y the focus? And he'll just, again, spin up to this visionary level of being like, well, we just, you know, we just need money and we just need more money. We need to hit like a billion users. And it's like, you're not answering the fucking question because everybody wants a billion users and everybody wants a billion dollars. We're talking about this all the time with regards to game production with regards to running a studio, anything like that, which is like looking at the lagging indicators that are the same across every company. Like we want more people buying our stuff. We want our stuff to be better. Does not give you a strategy that you can actually bring down to the ground and make work. Like yeah, with the stuff, yeah, the lagging indicators, as you put it, are the side effects of the stuff you actually do right exactly. in the moment. Yeah. So the hard thing oh. is not... Point, everyone knows what the fuck the lagging indicator. It's just you can ask a preschooler what's good about a business, and it's like we need more money. It's like if that's the extent <laughs> that you could go to, you are not actually providing direction, right? You're you're looking at a future point, and so when he starts spouting off about like payment platforms, everyone else, and it's like, okay, that could that could be strategic, you know, strategic direction for how to get to there. But again, like the the distance between where Twitter is and that is so vast that it's not like, oh, that's clearly a next step and we already have kind of some capability in that direction. Let's go. So he's basically saying like Twitter should be YouTube and PayPal and Correct. TikTok. Literally. It's like and what he said. <laughs> yeah. If you like this is the thing about I I because we talk about this in games too, like I said, right? Like this is the thing about about ideas being worth nothing, which we always say. The right? idea person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and because like the fact is like we have been to tech conferences where people come up to us and they throw ide ideas at us of like the awesome app they want to have that mm -hmm. now, you know, we need to make and they don't know anything about how the details work. They haven't thought about any of the details of like, oh, well, what about all these legal things? And, you know, right? Mm -hmm. They just come up with the same thing of like, here's the 11 things that I think would be awesome, right? And like, you should go do that and then give me all the money from it, right? And like the ideas that those people come up with are not worse than what Elon is throwing at the wall. No. You know, they're the same. No. It's the same level of like thought of, of just like, oh, yeah, we could like ha let people send each other money on Twitter. It's like that's not a good – that's not an interesting yeah. idea. Like you don't need to be a genius to come up with that, right? Uh, it's – these are just well, – even my point is even if it is, even if that is like the thing, the reality is like this where the company need to go how, yeah. Yes, where the company's at versus where that is, that's so far of a jump that you're 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 forcing everybody in the world to fill in the gutter for you, to fill in that gap, right? And it's like to do the actual work and answer all the actual questions. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and it's like I yeah, I that the amount of waste that But I mean that's what a, is, that's that's what a CEO of a large company is, right? Like they they come in and they they provide direction in some way or they set a vision and then they essentially just uh force people to get on board and people who don't get on board get I mean this well I think but I mean a, that's a good CEO true. though that's but a good CEO comes in and they manage it by get by procuring context from the people yes. who are closer to the actual problem and solution domains, right? And yeah. then basically taking all these disparate parts where nobody, like no one person can have all the context. It's just, it's just impossible, right? Um, and that, that level of, because we talked about this in the past year, the level of abstraction is to keep going up as you move up a corporate hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that somebody can, can keep track of enough high level information that they have like a full picture. And so like a good, a good uh, manager at any level, right? Mm -hmm. Is somebody who hits the right level of abstraction and then knows what their people know. Right. And trust them to provide good advice. Right. With, uh, yeah, it's, they, a, it's a two way conversation. Yeah. Do you think style. Yeah. Do you think Elon has listened to any fucking thing anybody at Twitter has told Clearly him? Clearly has. <laughs> he, he, just said, he like <laughs> moves in and then like didn't talk to anybody. And just like fired people with him. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think the whole, the whole thing is just, it's not good. And I think to your point, Adam, it's like a really good. CEO is much more like a chief communications officer in the sense that like they're a politician, right? It's like, what do you see yeah. with politicians? It's like you pick a message 
Yeah, they're not and a you dictator. Just, you're, not, you're not a dictator, but you pick a message and you just repeat the message over. And you can see this is like in like Microsoft's uh, currency. It's like they, they pick or Phil Spencer from uh, I think Xbox Gaming does a really good job of this, where it's like they have a thing that they are orienting the whole ship around. And it's very clearly stated as far as what that vision is. And it might be a distant thing, but then they have, again, like pillars as far as repeatedly stated ways in which they're going to be mm-hmm. moving toward that thing. Right. And that's, there's not like an off the cuff thing with 20,000 people on the call where everyone's just confused of what the fuck they should be doing. I think if you, if you're a CEO and you get done with an all hands meeting and everyone's just confused, like <laughs> you are. So maybe not a good metaphor is job. like the company is like a, is like a, a ship sailing the seas and the mm-hmm. CEO is supposed to be the wind. Yes, right? exactly. Like, yes. like if the ship is really big, then, you know, even if you've got like a really strong message, like a lot of wind, like, an, like a, a, mm-hmm. a clear sense of direction, it's still going to take some time to like get all the sails oriented and like the ship's mm-hmm. going to take a while to kind of turn, right? And then it'll take some time to pick up speed in that direction as mm-hmm. well, right? But what Elon is doing is he comes in and he's just a fucking hurricane. He's just like, here's 60 different gusts of wind. Also, there's smoke. I'm blowing smoke in your face, yeah. too, oh, and yeah. some fog. Also, and it's like, coming in nine directions at the same the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, good luck boat. steering this boat because half of you are dead now. Uh, yeah, it's like, yeah. what on earth? Well, so, yeah. I, so yeah. well, like I say, some of, the, some of the great stuff we've seen, too, is how, like, uh, that he, so they came in and, and, and for whatever reason, Elon asked uh, everybody to submit all of their, their one year of most recent commits to the code base. And this oh, came yeah. prior to uh, a few days prior to uh, half of the staff being fired. So there was a lot of suspicion. This was, this was never confirmed, but, but it's like, why would you ask for, for, to see all the code that all the people have committed and then a few days later fire people? And so the suspicion was that was that somehow they aggregated information, li- likely lines of code written, mm, um, and used those as metrics to decide who to fire. Problem is how many lines of code you produce or any kind of quantifiable measurement of your code has nothing to do with mm-hmm. the quality of the code or the importance of the code or whatever. And in many cases, people working on the most sophisticated projects are writing very little code because they spend so much time investigating and researching all the different places in the existing code base that their project needs to touch and everything yeah, like most that. Most of their time is spent building and maintaining their mental model of the yeah, complex. It's like, a, it's like a 97% reading, 3% writing mm-hmm. kind of a thing. But right? also when it comes to like the direct doing of stuff, right? Like the people who are, who are, cause it's like, cause like a, an institution that's big, it's a whole bunch of teams and then teams of teams. Yeah. And, right. And, and so much of their capability is dependent on not even the people who are best at like the direct, you know, fingers to keyboard coding part of the job, right. Or design mm-hmm. part of the job or whatever. But the people who are able to work with people and help them out of getting out of a funk, you know, and like, mm-hmm. and be there as a second pair of eyes and ears, right? Uh, like that, the value of that kind of a person is is extremely visible and obvious to their team, right? And invisible, but completely in invisible in every metric. And yep. if you lose all of those people, then morale is gone, right? Mm-hmm. And also the the thing that's like keeping the teams afloat and like making sure they work well, function together, right, yeah. is also gone, right? Yeah. And now you just have a whole bunch of people who may or may not be because they're using the raw metrics anyway, right? But you have a whole bunch of people who may or may not be good at like the fingers on keyboard part of the job, right? But can't, but don't have the same ability to like work together, actually, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You remove the glue yeah. usually when yeah. you yeah. do so, stuff so you like just this, like right? yeah, you just ripped out like. All this institutional knowledge, all these relationships, all these people who who have in a lot of cases have been there for a long time yep. and wow. know and and know so many things about the inner workings of the company. You know, it, it's basically like a Thanos snap, right? It it's really like, is okay. It's horrifying. Okay, because essentially, like if you rank people by lines of code and then just like fired the lower half of them, essentially what you've done is you have just randomly fired half Correct. of the people. Yes. Yep. Yes. So. So basically, he Thanos snapped the, the company, uh, <laughs> and as a result, uh, a bunch of shit stopped working because they didn't know what. Like uh, suddenly, there's a bunch yeah, of problems of because people who know things are no longer there. So then they reached out to a bunch of people that they fired and asked them to come back. <laughs> so, 
Uh, and then, and then the, the next move was like, or like his, so his first move in the midst of all these firings and shit, his first move was, was it, he's, he claims to be all about free speech. So his thing is like, Twitter needs to be a place where people can express their ideas free of consequence, basically, which is this sort of like juvenile way of thinking about free speech, right? Mm -hmm. That like, I can say whatever I want and nobody gets to be mad about it or say anything to me or anything. But it right? always means, the people who say this, it always means, but you can't say things that I don't want. You can't, yeah. yeah. I uh, I want to be able to say all the things that I want yeah. without anybody doing with anything With no to me. consequences. Yeah, with free speech for me, not for thee, yeah. right? And so- <laughs> So he comes in and he's like, and he sets his his dumb idiot laser eyes on the blue check mark, <laughs> right? He's like, there, that's the the verified check mark is the thing that I'm gonna do that I'm okay. gonna seize upon, uh, which is in Twitter up until now the blue check mark was a verified check mark where you would have to uh, send information to a team of people at Twitter and say like. This is me or this is my actual official account as a company or a person or whatever. So if you see a blue check mark, you know that that is that person. Actually the person, yes. And so it's a way of creating trust, trusted information, right? Um, it was also something that Twitter needed to do because they were being sued by companies and people because of being impersonated so, yeah. on their platform in the earlier days. Yeah. So then Elon comes in and he's like – He's like, I don't, and I still can't quite figure out the reasoning behind this. So I'm, I not even, I'm, not even gonna, I'm not even, I'm not even going to guess at why he thought this would be a good idea. But the idea he had was get rid of the verification process entirely mm -hmm. and just let people pay an $8 a month subscription for the check mark. <laughs> now, I want to so, know, because like, because the, they announced this, right? And I don't know if what happened to you guys, but I know my my game designer sense was immediately like, yeah, this is going to be obvious. Oh yeah. Oh, because yeah, in, in, a so obvious. in a nanosecond, I was like, yep, I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like <laughs> what you know from doing any actual, you know, interactive design with human beings is that human beings, they misuse everything you get. Like you give someone a hammer and if they just like happen to have a can of beans open, like, or a can of beans nearby, they're like, kind of want to get in there, they're just going to hammer some beans. You're like, don't do that with that, you know? And if we saw this in, with level heads. they're covered in beans. And that's yeah. the whole other yeah. thing. And so it's, like you, it's, it's, all, it's all about incentives too, right? Because you're asking like, what yeah. is what do people get and what does it require for them to get that? And it's all like, everything is an incentives analysis, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was just obvious because like his claim was, the claim he made, which is like, again, to a game designer, obviously, or anybody who, you know, knows that people exist and thinks about people. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, like, that be a fucking designer like, for. Yeah, you don't have to like. You could just like know how people like operate at the basest fucking level. Um, it's obvious because he was like, well, if we if people have to pay to get verified, then that'll keep the bots and the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the like the charlatans out because it'll cost them something to do it, right? Uh, except that what's the value of doing it, mm. right? The value is that people think you're legit instantly, right? You could become so, Elon Musk for yeah, $8. So, so the, and honestly, so like the cost it, it, to, the cost to, you know, to, to benefit trade off there is so high actually that mm -hmm. it actually incentivizes the exact thing. Like, yeah, you're not gonna have an army of bots doing it. But right? you can. You still it's could. eight it's eight dollars a yeah. month per bot. Well, like, like, if you're trying to, to sway to, an election, right? That, yeah, that's that's a great you're a nation state <laughs> actor. It, like yeah. A, you can have a thousand propped up fake accounts. Like imagine like Okay, say you're yeah. Uh, foreign Russian country, government pays eight thousand dollars yeah. a month to unseat a democracy. Yeah, that's Easy. a great deal. Let's so yeah. cheap. It's cheap yeah. as dirt. <laughs> yeah. So like the 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 logic of this is so obvious, and, th and this is like this is the the again like when you take an idea person like this, right, who is never actually confronted with the reality of of like the complexity of the actual world because everybody's insulating them from it by handling the details because they, they just dictate it from top to bottom and surround themselves with yes people. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and you can see that cause like, cause like people like Trump and Elon Musk, they just, anybody who says no to them or it's asks fired. a question is yeah. just fired instantly. Right. And so these people don't actually, they, they actually are incapable of understanding 
that there's actual nuance to the world. They just because they've never they've never touched it, right? Mm-hmm. And there's always been a, a, a deep pillowy layer of money between them and yeah. the rest of the world, <laughs> yeah. insulating them. Yeah, and they can, and then they can, in the end, they can say like it's somehow everybody else's fault for fucking up their you know their vision. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they just. They just literally don't – and that, to me, that's the thing that's so just remarkable, you know, is like this complete, complete obliviousness to humanity, right, on the way of like understanding the consequences of, of incentives. I think it's the same thing anytime I think about how our government is set up and like how mm-hmm. everything works. And every little thing, I'm just like, if you were to design this as a human being thinking about human beings, you would do none of this this way. Yeah, right. Yeah. This is all the stupidest way to do absolutely everything. Right. And, and but here we are because people aren't thinking about people as people. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I think I have a I have a couple of takeaways from from this. Like one is to kind of highlight mm-hmm. Sam's point of like if you're still an Elon Musk fan, you know, maybe Reconsider. don't. Right? <laughs> but if, you, if you somehow like you, if you somehow still believe these are like savvy business moves or whatever. Right. Um, you can't separate this whole this whole idea of like, oh, like it's just, it's just good business or whatever. Right. You can't separate this from the fact that there are actual people here and that everything about an economy and business is fake and made up, right? So a person can't go into a company and with no notice fire 3,500 people, right? And then mm-hmm. with five hours notice, tell people you have to work from the office now who mm-hmm. – because Twitter's official stance was work from home now starting in COVID, right? And they actually said yep, we're not going back to the office. Never going back. And then Elon at 2 in the morning US time was like, hey, starting today <laughs> – you now have to be in the office 40 hours a week, right? Yeah, but also that, but that's actually that's actually not intended to get people back to the office. It's intended to get people to quit. Oh, you know, I know, so yeah, I know. But that's it, the point. What he's doing is he's doing a purge yeah. to get rid of anybody who might who not might be no. 100% on board with everything that he does. Or more he's dependent on it, right? As in like in that in an all hands meeting. Which yeah. I want to point out because like someone was like, how given the attrition we're already experiencing, how is your remote work policy, not just going to accelerate the attrition trend. How are we going to get new people in who actually can possibly replace the giant number of people who are going to leave? And he just repeated some line about like, just bottom line, if you don't come into the office, you don't, you know, you don't have a job anymore. And it's yeah, like, it's again, just, you're it not, is to get people out. Yeah, so get people yeah. out. But, but that's the, that's the point, right? Is that even if this was shrewd business, which I guess not at best, extremely questionable, but even if it was, this is the most vile human shit, you know, because mm-hmm. like, yeah, you can just say like, these are big numbers. Like, oh yeah, I fired 3,500 people. Right. And, and sure you can be out there being like, oh, it's a whole bunch of these cushy tech jobs or whatever. Right. That's not how the fucking world works. You know, like yeah. sure. Maybe some people are getting paid astronomical amounts. Cause there's a lot of that in the tech industry. That's true. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but like how many of those have $200,000 of student loans? You know, how many of those mm-hmm. have are supporting their entire family with their income? Right. Like, uh, even if you're you're still like I don't care about those people because they're already rich people, right? Well, again, which is not yeah. People not being true. randomly fired is is not generally just not it's good. Not <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. This is not yeah. good. But also, this fucks with the whole tech industry, right? Because now all of a sudden there's this huge wave of of thousands of, of literally engineers. like enough people to staff like the majority of companies actually, right? Because most companies are not operating at that scale. And so now all of a sudden the people who have nothing to do with Twitter at all, right? And the rest of the job market are now it's harder for them to deal with being mm-hmm. in the industry because the competition for the job space has just gone up. Right. And you well, except mm-hmm. there is one thing that might happen though. Because this this happened here in St. Louis when a lot of the brewmasters were were suddenly free from employment yeah, yeah. because oh, yeah. what was it the the Bush uh a, yeah, Anheuser and, Bush? Yeah. There was like a buyout or something. One of these giant beer companies here it's, in uh, St. Louis. It's but because, yeah, well, yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, and they're owned by that is like the Belgian company or something. Or, uh, That's what they got. Yeah, InBev, InBev bought in them Bev, back yeah. in. InBev uh, bought. Yeah, so this, this InBev bought a little bit. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so then there was a, a huge number of these brewmasters here in St. Louis who were responsible for brewing all this beer, and they had been doing it for a long time, and they were experts at it. And suddenly they were all out of work. They all got fired because they moved to operations and stuff like that. And so then in the following five years, uh, St. Louis was just suddenly inundated with microbreweries. All, <laughs> brew, all these brewmasters were like, fuck it, I'm going to start making my own beer. And then yeah. they start up their own business. And then, yeah, if you want so great the, beer, like just 
St. Leslie. It's, it's good like, spot. There's good <laughs> shit here. Oh, yeah. There's just, yeah, like anything to your taste. Like there's all ranges of like lights to darks and weird flavor combinations and, you know. Uh, but then it's like one of the things that I think pr- probably is not anticipated with something like this, which is if you take 3,500 talented software engineers who know each other. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Literally you fire teams, them all. You know? Yeah. You yeah. fire them all at the same time. You may have just spawned like a hundred competing companies yeah. you on accident. Yeah. Of the people you know. who actually know how to do the stuff because yeah. you didn't actually check to find out who knows how to do the things before you fired yeah. all of them, right? Yeah, because the fact is like when uh, when Instagram was bought by Facebook, it had 12 employees, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so like it doesn't take that many – It was bought for many, a billion dollars with 12 yeah. employees. So it doesn't take that many smart people to make a company that can compete with Facebook, mm-hmm. right? And so if you're just going to suddenly just set loose 3,500 of these people, <laughs> like, g- good fucking luck. Something's going to happen, yeah. you know? Yeah. Sheer, they, you, just, you were safer just keeping them in-house and basically bribing <laughs> them to not start companies, yeah, which true. is basically what you could think of as their salary. <laughs> yeah, because, like, yeah, I think we got right. Because, like, cause like, if you need to buy out one of those companies, then there's two It's going to cost you a lot more dollars. than what that salary yeah. would have been. <laughs> yeah, but the—, but the but there's an important takeaway that I think is actually relevant to uh, anybody trying to run a company or make games for a living or, or do really anything, right? There's a lot of good takeaways. For I mean, there's a lot. Good, <laughs> but there's one that's actually very just like instantly important, which is and, – and applicable to us even at our tiny scale, right? Which is the idea of, of trust and contracts mm-hmm. with other entities, right? Um, because yeah. – uh, so imagine that you have a good relationship with Twitter and you're some third party company. Right. And like, and you have a contract with them that says, Oh, like, well, can, we, we will do this work right for, for X monetary exchange or whatever. Right. And let's say that contract has some ambiguities in it, right. About mm-hmm. what the exact nature of this relationship is, how it gets terminated, what happens when it's terminated and so on. Right. But you know, you operated in really in good faith with the people at Twitter at the time. Mm-hmm. And you, you knew those people personally, you know, and, <laughs> Uh, and you, you had a high amount of trust because you knew them as business people. You're like, well, they wouldn't fuck me over here because like that would look bad for them and so on. Right. And, uh, and so you have this contract that's a little loosey goosey, you know, but, uh, but right, like, all contracts, they're all, all contracts loosey-goosey. are loosey goosey. They do require good faith. On they can't the cover everything. They require they trust. Yeah. yeah. And so, so then, and then this, this, uh, this tyrant shows up, fires everybody that you knew there. Right. And intentionally operates in bad faith in all of his business interactions, right? And now, now your question is, shh, what am I on the hook for now, right? Because mm-hmm. this contract basically can just be reinterpreted, right? Yep. Yep. And and so this is why. So th- this is how we we interact with all of the third parties that we interact with, which is we we don't ask like, what is the relationship with them now? Right. We ask, what would happen if they get bought by a private equity firm? (laughs) Right. That's like, that's actually how you want to make sure you are thinking about your contracts, no matter how much you like people. Right. Mm -hmm. And we even did this with ourselves when we were looking at the 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 contract we have within amongst ourselves for our own company. Right. Which is to say, Mm -hmm. it's not about how much we trust each other right now. Right. It's imagine like one of us gets like a steel rod through the brain and becomes like a completely different person, right? Mm-hmm. And wants to be an asshole and there's just no stopping it, right? Then how do we protect ourselves from one of us becoming that person, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and still like operating in as much good faith as you can because as Sam said, it's always there's it's always required. going to be some room there because you can't actually nail everything explicitly. But if you start with that assumption and then do your best to, to still operate – with good faith in those negotiations and stuff, right? But just be firm and saying, well, even though I trust you guys right now not to mm-hmm. do this. So, so, so we've had examples of this with other companies where there were parts of the contract that we were like, if they enforce this, it would be bad for us, right? Or if they just interpret it in a certain way. Yeah. That, and there's, so, there's, there's, totally. yeah there's certain platforms and partners we haven't worked with because we could not get yeah. a certain language removed from the contract yeah. that would – and their response was just to say, open. yeah. And their response was just to say, oh, well, well, we, well, we never actually like use this, right? Yeah. But then we're like, and then we why always don't you say, take it out, right? And, yeah, they're, and yep. they're like, well, we just don't want to like go through the legal, you know, process of like, yeah, that's so shady. Yeah. So it's so shady to have a thing that that's that's so obviously detrimental to the other party. They say, they say, can we, we not have it in there? 
Yeah, and you say, well, we're going to leave it there, but don't worry. Just trust us. Don't mm-hmm. worry about it. Just trust. Like, that's so messed up. <laughs> yeah, it's really weird. And this is, I think this is a good, like, anytime you you're find yourself in that position or you're, like, working with, you know, a group and – and somebody on our team is like, oh, well, you should just let this slide because we want to get this contract done. And like, I think we can trust these people, right? Remember Twitter. <laughs> Remember mm-hmm. Elon Musk. And just and just ask yourself the question, what if Elon Musk bought that company? That I'm <laughs> with, right? Yeah. What would I does want your, this contract to look like yeah. in that scenario? Does your contract protect you? Well, and this is also, I mean, this is this is in the in the midst of a wave of lots of people um, really starting to push for a unionizing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. There's even like Starbucks uh, locations are unionizing, and and there's just more and more sort of talk about this. Um, this is the exact the sort of place, behavior right? that would cause the remaining employees of something like Twitter to actually unionize, right? Yeah. Some, some, some. Oh, yeah. Because like, yeah. yeah, but nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Well, and if, you know, if they had been unionized to begin with, then yeah, it this would be very difficult time. to just suddenly fire half of them, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so, because, it, you know, and it, it, it kind of makes sense in a, in a balance, in a, in a checks and balances kind of way, which is like, if you have one entity that has billions of dollars – and then it is negotiating individually against singular people yeah. who just have, you know, thousands of dollars. Then the company always, always has a hundred percent of the leverage and the person on the other end has to do whatever the company asks them to do. Right. Mm-hmm. But if suddenly it's okay, now we have 7,000 employees working for the company as part of a union. And then we have the company then the company can't do anything at all without that union's approval, mm-hmm. right? Um, and the union the union exists to work for the company, and the company exists to work with the union to achieve its goals. Mm-hmm. It's not it's no longer a just continually extracting cash from people, right? So like this is the kind of shit that is short term thinking on on the part of of these business people to say like we'll just we'll just sort of use and abuse our employees um, yeah. as, as much as we want to. Yeah, I mean, why would they care? Because the like, CEOs never last more than like a few years. Few years you know? jump shit. Yeah. yeah, they extract as much money as they can and then they leave. And, but it's also the thing with like shareholder value, right? Because we're all living under this myth that you can just increase shareholder value indefinitely, <laughs> right? The only way you can do that is by continuing to extract more and more money out of the people who are making money available to you, whether that's via their labor or via, you know, their being customers somewhere. Uh, Cause things can't just grow indefinitely. That's not how well, there's, yet. well, there, there's a, there's a late stage to it. Right. Cause like there's, there's your natural market growth, which is where like your, your, your market share goes up, you get more and more customers. So you can keep using the same business model the whole time, as long as your customer base keeps growing, because your, your revenues will be going up always. Right. But then at a certain point, you you can't gain market share anymore, which is where you have something like Twitter or Facebook or where like Facebook saw its first decline in users ever or like in yeah. registered But that was ever, after right? they had almost everybody on the planet had a Facebook yeah, account. Yeah, exactly. You know? like, and so so what you see there with Facebook is like it's it's not enough under our infinite growth model to say like, well, we – good job, guys. We did it. We won capitalism. We, ma- mm-hmm. we, we maxed out our market share and now we're just going to – Cruise. cruise like yeah. that's not yeah that's not now, an option now if you already yeah. have all of the people possible then that means month over month you have to extract more and more money out of each one of exactly people, right so this is where you see things like uh like car manufacturers are trying to come up with ways to make you pay subscriptions to like use heated seats <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right because it's like okay like we're we just can't sell any more car like it's it's unreasonable for us to think that our market share is going to go up by more than like a one or two percent, mm-hmm. right? Um, or that our total number of units sold is going to go by more than one or two percent in a given year. So how do we make ten percent more money? Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, how do we make twenty percent more but money? Of like, course, like because you don't need to, right? The only because like once you hit like a part of the market, you're a stable company, you got a stable market share, right? You're making products people buy, all this kind of stuff, right? And you've kind of done because like thing like the leverage of like advertising to try to take more than more like the leverage of all this stuff just keeps going down the the mm-hmm. more like stable and successful you get the more saturated at, you've gotten at, at, yeah at meeting the market with whatever you're doing right because yeah so once you hit market saturation like the leverage of everything you do just like just plummets right 
But also, though, you're at steady state. You're doing yeah. fine. There's Everything's no fine, right? The, and, like, and this whole idea that everybody has of like, oh, these companies are collapsing, like, and like this kind of panic that everybody has because the panic is not doesn't match the reality of like what's actually happening at these companies, which is people are getting paid, the company's making money, right? And everything's actually fine. Um, and like when you look at these like layoffs and stuff, right? These like big layoffs that are happening. That's in the context of these companies making more money than they ever have. Right. Yeah. Many of them are flush. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because they still need to do something to increase yeah. the next quarter's increase. Yeah, yeah. Right. So even even if like they're just making. Right? Yeah. Because the whole idea with the with that public market of company shares is that they have to work under the myth of infinite growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think yeah. what's weird about all this stuff to me is that there's there's very frequently there's instances, I think, where you see you see interesting lateral growth that is related to the thing that you started with in a, in a product sense. So like in the cars, they're trying to do a services approach, but for some reason, there's the thing is there's a shitload of services that you have to do on a car, right? Every year mm-hmm. to keep it running, to keep it going. And for some reason they're like, well, we're not going to think anything about that part of the equation. We're going to make some make that new better, yeah. ones that involve yeah monetizing parts of the car that have never been monetized before. And it's like, Okay, again, interesting, good on you for for giving it a go. But like, I don't know how that got passive in single focus group tests being like, how would you feel about paying $8 a month for your heated car seats? Well, that's hilarious, right? Because that's exactly Absolutely. the thing that if I was in the market to buy a new car and I was like looking at features or whatever, and if I was told that by the salesperson, right? No, oh, z- I would, I would say... I would say no. And I would walk out the door and never consider that whole fucking brain. <laughs> <laughs> Which, but, it, yeah. like, but it's hilarious, right? Because like, it's because it's, it's a symmetrical pettiness, right? Because like, oh yeah, absolutely. they're trying to get me to buy something for tens of thousands of dollars, right? And then they want to tack on $10 a month. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, it's fucking offensive is what, mm-hmm. is what yeah, that is, Yeah, but here's right? the thing, Adam. The thing is, within five years, you won't have a choice. Yeah. Because if, if one car company is like, we want to charge for heated seats and and customers are like, well, fuck that. Right. But if every other car company sees that and they go, hmm, well, and they, they start charging for heated but seats, that's the thing, then there's always that's just how it works it, And they're going to advertise that. And that's what I'm going to buy, you know, or there's the, the short EU. Term. To be honest, because well, like, the, the, yeah. the EU fucking made, and now Apple has to give you USB Cs for your phones now, right? And it's like, mm-hmm. thank you. And Apple had some spiel about like, oh, this is bad for consumers. And everyone's like, literally, it's not. Like, yeah, can we stop? Literally, fuck right stop off. Pervade. But that took it's like fine. sixteen years. <laughs> it took a minute. I, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree. It took a but minute. But the reason it but takes like, so long is because the because the US just has no rules, you know. And yeah. so because you can have so much corporate strength. Uh, in the context of the United States market that you can just like, you can just avoid Mm -hmm. any consequences elsewhere for a very long period of time. Yeah. I think my biggest takeaway from watching this Twitter stuff is, is that the, and especially like, this is the first time I've seen basically direct interaction between Elon and employees through that particular town hall thing that I read. Right. It's very long. Like there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And the biggest takeaway for me is basically that what appears to be visionary leadership in Elon's case in particular is so lacking in context, nuance, and the strategic stair steps to get you to that vision that any that could actually, uh, again, be repeated and have other people on other teams understand what it is that they can then go do autonomously themselves, that that gap is so wide with that dude that... Anything that yeah, anything that he hops on or is like very seriously the quote unquote driver of, which is currently he's like driving Twitter, right? Um, I would be extremely wary about <laughs> where it's going. Uh, the more he pays attention to it, because his yeah, attention is just it's like a cost. I think it's, it's like a dumb eye of Sauron. <laughs> yeah. I think it's actually it's exactly the same as the stories that we heard from all the like the the White House leaks from from Trump's presidency. You know? Yeah, it's got the or same. Vibe. So much of why why it didn't just completely collapse was actually because of his staff secretly preventing things from happening that he was yes. trying to make happen because, because they lacked, <laughs> they lacked. So they didn't have details. Right. And they didn't make any sense. Right. And so that made it possible to like create an insulation barrier so that, so that the reason things stayed afloat at all was because of him not being able to do what he was trying to do. Right. And I think, 
my bet is, I mean, there's a reason that like Elon's successful companies are the ones that he just took over from somebody else, right? As like he just bought because it was already a successful company, right? And yeah, over time he replaced everybody with yes men and all that stuff, right? But the reason those things like stayed afloat enough, I would bet anything. I would oh, it's just the same deal. bet everything that it's because there are some key people in there whose lives are a living hell, right? Mm-hmm. But who D- are insulating uh, actually right. against so that so that basically things are successful despite his presence, right? Yes, not because of. You know, yeah. And you know. I think I think the the thing I just want to drive in is like it it can it is very easy to speak in a way that is visionary, right? So if you even if you read the thing, it's like all of what Elon always links back to is something about expanding humanity or greater humanity. All of the shit he talks about always Just ends up empty somewhere. fucking phrases in this line. Yeah. And it's like, it, well, it's the thing is like, it's not necessarily empty. It's I think it's one of those things that it, it hits everybody in the same spot, which is like, Oh, that sounds like big and grand and cool. I'm like, yeah, I want to be future. part of something. I want to be yeah. part of it. But it's like, but it is, that's what I mean. It's like, beat. it's empty. Cause it doesn't have, there's no, there's actual, nothing beyond like, that. Yeah. Beyond yeah. the vibe. It's just a vibe check. That's it. Yeah. And so, you know, just like, just get your, get your feelers up a little bit whenever people start to, I mean, I, you know, I could do that in a second for butterscotch, you know, if you want to. Well, it's one of the things that we, to. that we constantly joke about. We're like, if we actually wanted to be really rich people, it would be so easy to be a charlatan, just like all the rest of them, you know? You start conning. Right? It's a con game. You just start, you just start running cons and exploding bonkers. people and like destroying, you gotta, in destroying the lives around you to consume their, their resources, right? Like that's how the process works and it's not hard. It's a lot harder to be successful without doing that. It's a lot harder to run a successful business with where, scruples. Yeah. With yeah. Scruples <laughs> where, <laughs> where you're not a millionaire. Right. Um, because, because you have to like, cause like managing the money has to matter. Managing your people has to matter because you're not insulated by the snores wealth, but you're also, you're, you're unable just to do literally anything because you actually have to act on like ethical humanist principles, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's, infinitely harder so if you're impressed by you know a billionaire titan of industry crushing everything around them and destroying companies as they go right like it's that stuff isn't Godzilla. actually you know hard I mean? it requires yeah. you to not give a fuck about people mm-hmm. and to start rich and that's, to start rich yeah. awesome. if, <laughs> if you have those two things like that stuff is just possible now right but i i don't think i don't think not giving a shit about people is something we should be lauding you know mm-hmm. At all. No. no. And if you want to see a great dramatized example of this, there's a show, I think it was on Netflix, called Halt and Catch Fire, um, mm. which is basically it's a sort of a – it follows these characters in the 1980s into the 90s during like the dawn of the – it's a it's a fictionalized show, mm-hmm. but it's like during the dawn of the, the home personal computing era and it's these – this guy comes into an existing company that's already doing some other electronic stuff, and he's almost like a Steve Jobs kind of a character. And he's he wants to come in and like convert this company into making a, a home personal computer that can like become like the first major you know thing. And he does this exact Elon Musk kind of thing where he basically has no actual like engineering skill or technical understanding of what it is that is doing. And he makes these outrageous sort of directionless demands of his engineers and just completely decimates the company. Mm-hmm. And like, it's, it's a great show, <laughs> uh, but, but like, and it follows like the, the two, the two main characters that are the, the few main characters that it follows is like, one is this sort of like charlatan kind of um, con man. And then the other characters are like these engineers who already were there at this company and now they have to like suddenly deal with this guy and they're they're trying to make it, his ideas happen mm-hmm. but they're insane right <laughs> so, and it's just yeah. like a great it, source of drama and conflict there is know. some power in being occasionally uh you know off like off your rocker when it comes to like the ideas that you're bringing to the table right but, but again, sure, yeah. there's power in the idea part of it but the power rapidly gets perverted and corruptive once you uh, try to m- maneuver it into like a tactical space of doing stuff. Like I saw that after the hurricane, he was like, the cyber truck's going to be waterproof. Everyone's like, literally, no, it's not. Like it has never we been all, said. It's, not also. Also. <laughs> it's, not <gonna> yes. <laughs> it's like, stop it. Like, and also like just, the cyber truck was unveiled like what, five years ago or something? Mm-hmm. It's still not available. And in its unveiling, they were like, it's dent proof. And then he fucking hit it with a sledgehammer and it dented. Like, <laughs> like, at what point do people just stop, stop listening? 
you know, soon, uh, I think. I guess maybe maybe he detected that people did, were stopping listening, so he bought an entire social media platform where <laughs> people would have to listen to him. Maybe that's what it was. <sighs> anyway, so like, that kind of took up our whole episode, but hilarious nonetheless. What a, what a situation. What yeah. a situation. Yeah, but, uh, so I'm sure. sorry to all those people whose lives are being completely fucked by this, uh, mm-hmm. but I hope you become, you know, I hope you build the next Twitter and, uh, and you know. Yeah, bring them down. <laughs> bring yeah. them, and then hire all the people that got fired, you know, in a few years. Yeah. Uh, so that's all. That's all the time we have for this week. We'd like to thank our producers, Fat Bard and Sampa DaCosta, for putting the podcast together. And thanks to our community moderators who keep our Discord running. To get more involved in the Butterscotch community, just go to podcast.bscotch.net, where we have links to the Discord, a way for you to donate, and links to the archives. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.